Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks for uh, uh, giving us a chance to talk. Uh, this is the beginning of a, we're unfolding a new century. Centuries have a way of acquiring labels. Uh, the 18th century was the time of the classics. The 19th was uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution. The 20th century was the century of mammoth wars, uh, a cold war that never got hot. Uh, the rise and fall of communism, the blossoming of technology, <clears throat> and now we're opening the 21st century. It could be that this will be known as the century of terrorism. I hope not, but we have kicked off the century with the events of 9-11 that certainly must give one pause in this regard. So the question I want to talk about today is whether nuclear proliferation, uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons into terrorist hands is inevitable. Uh, the good news is it is not. We are masters of our own fate. But let's just wind back 50 years to the days of uh, John Kennedy uh, when he first assumed the presidency 50 years ago. At that time, uh, John Kennedy announced his fears that within 15 or 20 years we would have 20 nuclear states. That's not the way it's turned out. We only have nine. About a dozen States have climbed out of the nuclear tree. Another half a dozen sit there like owls. Uh, they are thinking about going nuclear. But the point is, uh, proliferation has been slowed or undone. And, and the question is, what can we learn from this history? Uh, what went right and what went wrong? To do that, let's start uh, right with the, uh, with the seven aspirant states, seven nuclear states, states that wanted to be nuclear, uh, but that back down. <clears throat> the first two that most of this audience would never even think of considering are the post-World War II neutrals, Switzerland and Sweden. When World War uh, uh, II ended, those nations were industrial superpowers. Uh, their infrastructure was intact. They saw nuclear weapons as the route to maintain their safety between the growing blocks of East and West. And so Switzerland and Sweden embarked on very serious nuclear weapons programs. Uh, that is not a non sequitur. Uh, they were both had very serious scientific capabilities. Uh, Einstein came from Zurich. Uh, the uh, Lisa Meitner, who basically invented the expression nuclear fission, was living in Sweden. These nations were planning a serious programs. A documentation I've seen from the mid-60s shows that Switzerland was planning seven nuclear tests under the Alps. They were focused on an inventory of 250 nuclear weapons. And yet, happily, what happened is the internal democratic process worked. That within those countries, that the political process, people began to ask, why are we doing this? How much does it cost? What is it getting us? And those states concluded that nuclear weapons really weren't worth it because they weren't really weapons and that they decided that, that resources uh, and political capital could be better spent anywhere. And so Switzerland and Sweden uh, in 1970 were two of the first nations to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Another couple of states that were embryonic nuclear states that you may not have thought of were Brazil and Argentina. Now in the 70s, Brazil and Argentina had the same cozy relationship as India and Pakistan do today. Uh, they had the descendants of Spanish and Portuguese history. When the Brits left, I believe they created Uruguay just to keep those countries apart. When the, the military dictators took over in 1978, they decided to develop nuclear weapons so as to deal with the balance of power in South America. Uh, that the, uh, the program started in 78 and uh, the Argentinian people that were involved were guests in my home. I've talked about it. It was a serious program. Brazil and Argentina had reactors, they had money, they had talent. And yet, happily, as time went by, the Cold War ended, the military dictatorships were swept aside, democracy returned to those countries, and the United States began to lean on them and the other UN countries. But the U.S. leaned on Argentina and Brazil and said, this is not a good idea, why don't you stop? Uh, with various carrots and sticks. And so in 1991, those two countries signed a bilateral inspections agreements to assure each other that they really didn't have nuclear weapons programs. And in 1994, they signed the Treaty of Latileco, uh, which made all of South America a nuclear-free zone. Two more states that were marching down the nuclear path, but they quit. 
There's also three what I would call isolated or, or paranoid states. States that started down the nuclear path and quit for a variety of reasons. Why they started and why they quit are very important. First one is Taiwan. Taiwan started down the path to nuclear weapons in 1971. Why did they do that? They did that because they were voted off the island. Particularly, they were voted off the island of Manhattan when they lost their seat on the Security Council. 1971, the UN and the other political powers of the world decided to recognize Beijing rather than Taiwan as the capital of China, and the Taiwanese lost their seat on the Security Council. That led the government in Taiwan to conclude that the Americans are going to abandon us, the West is going to abandon us, we better have nuclear weapons to deal with this huge uh, Chinese monolith on the mainland. And so Taiwan embarked on a weapons, serious nuclear weapons program. They had reactors that they had bought from uh, other places, they had very good scientific staff, they had lots of money, and they were marching down the path. By 1998, they had produced 250 pounds of plutonium. But with the coming of the end of the Cold War and with uh, active U.S. involvement in this whole process, the U.S. leaned on the Taiwanese to convince them this is not a good idea. You do not need to have nuclear weapons. It doesn't do you any good. You can count on the U.S. Uh, umbrella. That's why all these Taiwanese-U.S. relationships, that's what convinced the Taiwanese to quit. And so, in 1998, we bought those, this 250 pounds of plutonium. It's now in the U.S. energy stocks. And Taiwan ceased being an embryonic nuclear power. Another place that went nuclear is South Africa. They, they went nuclear. They had nuclear weapons. The South African nuclear program started, interestingly enough, in Lisbon. Why in Lisbon? Because in 1974, uh, the Portuguese dictatorships, the wartime dictatorships of Mr. Salazar and Mr. Caetano, were thrown out in a, in a peaceful revolution, uh, and that the new go democratic government in Portugal decided we're not going to support colonies in Africa anymore. And therefore, they withdrew from Mozambique and Angola. Uh, and immediately, those countries neighboring South Africa immediately became havens for the guerrilla forces of the ANC that wanted to overthrow the South African government. This meant that suddenly South Africa is surrounded by states that are at least harboring guerrillas, and even more, after a few years, the Soviets saw the opportunity. The Soviets began to pour in forces and began to support very large Cuban forces that were moving into Angola, Mozambique, and so forth. Therefore, in 74, South Africa decided it needed to walk down the nuclear path so as to maintain its independence and protect itself given this surrounding threat. At the same time, they also acquired an interesting ally, Israel. Israel had a challenge in 1973. They were involved in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, the Israelis were taken by surprise. They really could have had a very tough time of it had the U.S. not intervened logistically. And so after the 73 war, they decided to make a deal with the uh, South Africans uh, in 74 and the Israeli officials went to South Africa and vice versa. The deal was uh, the Israelis would supply the technology and tritium, which was needed for boosting weapons. South Africans would provide uranium, which is a byproduct of gold mining, as well as the real estate to conduct nuclear tests. The nuclear weapons program, therefore, got off to a serious start in South Africa, uh, and a decade later, um, the um, South Africans were producing nuclear weapons. They were they were enriching uranium. Uh, by 1982 is when they first produced their first weapon. The South African uh, A-bomb was a very efficient um, gun type, similar to the uh, American uh, little boy used at Hiroshima. Uh, they were producing one a year. But in 1989, changes came along that changed the South African perception of all this. 1989, the Cold War ends. The Soviet Union goes broke. The Soviet Union can no longer support forces in the Angola uh, uh, neighboring states. Uh, they cannot support the Cubans, and therefore the threat of the neighboring countries begins to go away. Secondly, Mr. de Klerk comes to power, and he decides to change things in South Africa. He decides to abandon uh, apartheid, and he decides to abandon nuclear weapons. By the time he made this decision, South Africa had assembled six nuclear weapons.